Good evening and welcome everyone. We're so pleased to have such a wonderful crowd. We'll be joined by Marvin Kalb shortly, but he is stuck on the terrible traffic on the uh, Southeast Expressway. But I promise you, he will be here. On behalf of my colleague Tom McNaught, uh, who's the executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you all for coming. We welcome those people listening on WBUR and those uh, watching on C-SPAN. Let me acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, Raytheon, Boston Capital, the Boston Foundation, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. Uh, we have a wonderful panel, uh, and so uh, if you'll indulge us, we're going to not give long formal introductions, but let me just at least briefly uh, introduce uh, our wonderful uh, speakers today. Again, Marvin Cal will be here uh, shortly. He's the Edward R. Morrow Professor at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard University. His distinguished journalism career encompasses 30 years of award-winning reporting for CBS and NBC News. And he has a new book out, which he will be signing at the close of this forum and actually speaking on uh, tomorrow at Porter Square Bookstore called The Road to War, Presidential Commitments, Honored and Betrayed. Uh, next to me here is Nick Burns. He's currently a professor at Harvard University Kennedy School of Government after a legendary career as an American diplomat, where he served under, among others, Secretaries of State Madeleine Albright and Condoleezza Rice culminating as our country's Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. He's also a frequent columnist for the Boston Globe, and he actually recently wrote an op-ed about President Kennedy's address at American University. Sergei Khrushchev is the son of former Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. He and his wife, who is also here with us this evening, live in Rhode Island. They're both naturalized American citizens. For years, he served as a senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University, and he's also the author of a biography of his father, Khrushchev on Khrushchev, an inside account of the man and his era. Fred Kemp is the president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. He's the author of Berlin 1961, Kennedy, Khrushchev, and the Most Dangerous Place on Earth. Previously, he served as an editor, reporter, and columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Both of his parents were born in Germany and immigrated to the United States before World War II. And Adam Frankel recently left the White House where he served as a special assistant to President Obama and a senior speechwriter. He's here today in part to share the insights that he garnered as an assistant to President Kennedy's special counsel, Theodore C. Sorensen, when Mr. Sorensen was writing his memoir, Counselor, A Life at the Edge of History. Mr. Sorensen is uh, the man who wrote those famous words that we'll hear soon at American uh, University. I also want to acknowledge that Mr. Sorensen's wife, Gillian, is here with us uh, this evening. She's <laughs> Gillian has had a long career at the United Nations, and we're so pleased to, to have you here with us uh, uh, tonight. Uh, so we have a lot of history to cover, and uh, we'll try not to do it in too copious uh, detail. But I wanted to start by kind of setting the Cold War by looking especially at Berlin. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd ask the first question to Fred Kemp. Uh, you call Berlin uh, in 1961 the most dangerous place on Earth. Just give us the backdrop for uh, why you felt uh, or you feel that uh, Berlin was so dangerous at that moment? Uh, two things. First of all, I wonder whether we should call it the Cold War, whether we should call it World War III, uh, because in many respects it was. Uh, and it lasted roughly from 1945 to 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down and then, and then the collapse of the Soviet Union thereafter. If it was World War III, this was the front line. Uh, it, it, we had an ideological and political struggle on be, be, between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, but where they came together was uh, Berlin. The title, Most Dangerous Place on Earth, actually came from your father, and uh, it's, what, uh, it's what Nikita Khrushchev said to President Kennedy at Vienna about Berlin. Now, for him, it was dangerous politically, and it was also dangerous because that could be the tripwire for nuclear exchange. Uh, 
And the reason Berlin was more dangerous than other places is it's the only place on Earth where Soviet and US troops came together without intermediation. In 61, there was no wall. 63, there was a wall. But you still had them in this small patch of territory, and that didn't exist anywhere else. The other reason it was the most dangerous place on Earth in 61 was the flow of refugees, which at that point was so great that it became existential for the Soviet bloc to stop this flow, which is what the Berlin Wall did. But you still had after effects and ramifications from 61 into 63. So I would say even into 63, it remains the most dangerous place. So uh, again, the wall is built. And President Kennedy famously said he'd rather have a wall than a war. Uh, and yet, there's still this question about this, how much he's going to confront the Soviets in Berlin. Tell the story briefly about him sending over General Clay and then uh, that uh, moment that you really open your book with when uh, the tanks are actually facing one another. Yeah, I, my view of uh, the Berlin crisis and President Kennedy is it's one of the most dramatic demonstrations of how a president learns while being in office. Mm -hmm. uh, 1961 was not uh, President Kennedy's uh, best year. Uh, he himself, at the end of the year, says to the journalist Ellie Abel, uh, who at that point was the Detroit News Bureau chief, he asked President Kennedy, you know, would you cooperate with me? I'd like to write a book about your first year in office. And he said, why would you want to write a book about nothing but a string of disasters? And for him, it was the Bay of Pigs debacle. It was a Vienna summit, which by his own account didn't go well for him and Kennedy. And then there was uh, the acquiescence to the building of the Berlin Wall. And to answer your question, it was President Kennedy's view that by uh, standing by and allowing the wall to be built, uh, you could actually calm tensions with the Soviet Union, allowing the Soviet bloc to solve this refugee crisis and then engage in what he really cared about, which we'll get to with 1963, which was a nuclear test ban treaty, and to really diffuse the nuclear tensions uh, between East and West and avoid nuclear holocaust, which for him was actually much more important than the matter of a wall in Berlin, which one could understand. He thought he would create a less tense situation by creating this. But instead, you have a showdown of tanks at Checkpoint Charlie in October that year, just, just two months later, uh, where both sides are sort of testing limits in four power rights, much more detailed than that, but I won't go into that right now. And then ultimately, a year later, uh, the uh, Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis, right. which in many respects, and I'd love to hear Mr. Khrushchev's view on this, I think was brought about because uh, of uh, uh, Nikita Khrushchev's conclusion through the Berlin crisis that Kennedy was weak and he could test him. So he learns Cuban Missile Crisis. You see a much different President Kennedy than in the first year. And then 1963, you see a different one again, who at the same time is preparing the ground for a real shot at detente. And, uh, and, 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 and his nuclear test ban treaty, which was agreed to in the fall of 1963, uh, while at the same time, uh, uh, while at the same time, uh, also building up defenses and and seeking a way toward peace with this with this American University speech. Dr. Khrushchev, you want to say a word about what your father thought of Berlin? I have a couple of quotes. One of them quite colorful. He once called it a bone in my throat. He said it was a, he wanted to eradicate this splinter from the heart of Europe. But perhaps the most colorful is he called it the testicles of the West, where he could squeeze when he wanted to make the United States wince. Yeah, it is very interesting. And of course, it was, I agree with Mr. Kemper, it was a very dangerous place. But I will look at it from the little bit different angle. Because when the Fidel Castro at the Bay of Pigs announced that he officially joined Soviet bloc, the Cuba became for the Soviet Union the same as the West Berlin for the United States. From one side, it was the symbol. From the other side, it was small, useless piece of land, <laughs> deep inside hostile territory. But if you will not defend this, you will lose your face as a superpower. And we see here this very dangerous exercise of the both sides, Soviets in Berlin, American in Cuba, where you're trying just to resolve this crisis, trying to 
push opposite side somewhere behind. And what we are saying there with all these words, what was very important at that time, what we have not seen now, that both of these leaders were ready to negotiate with each other. They negotiated not with friends. Now we don't negotiate with enemies. They negotiate with enemies. And through this negotiation, you can present your point of view. You have understand opposite side. You have influence on the opposite side. For example, I fully disagree that it was failed negotiation in Vienna. It was introduction to each other, very important. And through this, they generated some this understanding and some mutual trust. Not as the friends, not as people have the same feeling that the people who understand that we are very different, we defend our national interests, each side, but we can work together to preserve the peace and we have all these results. So that's, um, that's a nice opening to, I wanted to ask Adam the stories that Ted Sorensen writes about. There was a glimmer of hope. We're, we're gonna really fast forward. We've, we've done, talked about Berlin in the fall of um, 1961, the Cuban Missile Crisis we won't go through, but the fall of 1962. And now we're in the spring of 1963. And there is this sense that, that there may be the possibility of a negotiation on a limited nuclear test ban. But could you pick up the story from the American so that's right, and the, and the American University speech, I think, can't be understood without the missile crisis. Um, and so in the wake of the missile crisis, I think there was a recognition on the part of Khrushchev and President Kennedy uh, that there has to be a better way to resolve these issues than nuclear confrontation. Um, the speech at AU was actually on the books for some time, and the President had talked early in the spring about giving a peace speech. And then as the date approached, um, they started thinking about it more seriously, figuring out what they were going to say. Um, Norman Cousins, around this time, who was editor of the Saturday Review, had a back channel to the Soviets and was emphasizing uh, to President Kennedy and Ted independently uh, that an overture from the Americans could be well received. Uh, and uh, in addition, there was an upcoming meeting of the Soviet Central Committee where it was Cousins' view uh, Khrushchev would feel some pressure to take an aggressive stance towards the United States if the United States did not act first. Uh, and so it was sort of in this context uh, that the president put together uh, with Ted the speech. Um, and it came in a busy time. Uh, the president was speaking at uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Hawaii. Uh, Ted had wanted to go on the trip, but the president said, why don't you stay in Washington uh, and work on the speech? Uh, so he, he did that, and then he flew to Hawaii uh, to take the trip back with the president, and they worked on it on the plane back. Um, and, you know, I think a couple notable things to me as a um, as a former presidential speechwriter, but also as someone who helped Ted uh, on his memoirs are, are the following. One is, part of the reason the speech is so good is that so few people had a hand in it. Um, what you often find with speeches is the more people get involved, uh, it often has a bad way of uh, ruining the quality of the speech. Ted used to always talk about that. Speeches drafted by committee uh, were not great speeches. And, and President Kennedy very deliberately uh, shared that speech with just a handful of people, Ted, Mac Bundy, uh, Secretaries of State uh, Defense, but not with the broader departments. Uh, and so that, that, I think, is one reason it, it was such a great speech, uh, rhetorically. Um, I also think that it's important um, for me to say, Ted was too modest to say this, but uh, as much as that speech, um, first and foremost, reflected President Kennedy's values and ideals, uh, it also um, reflected Ted's, uh, and Ted had been a, uh, had registered uh, for non as a non-combatant. Um, he had, was a self-described pacifist when he was younger, um, and so to a large extent that speech was a reflection of those pacifist ideals as well. Now one other thing that's interesting about the speech, you alluded to it, is that it really wasn't run by the State Department or the Department of Defense. And then, Nick, I'm going to ask you your reaction to the speech. But is that normal protocol when you were in the State Department? Are the uh, speeches at that level generally run out of the White House? Or are they, you know, for McNamara and Dean Rusk to not have seen a copy of that speech, would that have been a surprising thing? Well, I think for any administration, the, the president owns his own speeches. And so speech writing is a very important part of the presidency. It's the president's voice. It's the president's process. And there are times when uh, the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense, of course, are going to be involved to comment on a speech. But a lot of presidential speeches don't get wide 
copy within the administration beforehand for some of the reasons that Adam suggested. This, is, this speech that we're talking about was particularly true because I think if, if you had sent this to 100 different national security types in 1963 in the Kennedy administration, it would have been, it would have been torn to shreds because it was such heresy, mm -hmm. a departure from the orthodoxy of the Cold War. And Kennedy was trying to break out of that orthodoxy. So with that introduction, uh, let's watch a clip of the American University speech. As Adam said, uh, the president had just flown from California. He arrived early that morning and took a shower and actually went over to American University to deliver the speech. So we can bring the screen down. And uh, my colleagues, we can watch it on uh, the screen here. Well, well, while you're bringing it down, it may be helpful to note that at the time, the speech was very little noticed in the United States. So we're all talking about it as historic right now. Most great but, speeches are. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 also true. Gettysburg Address, I suppose it's true as well. But at that point, of course, the civil rights issue was much larger in, right. in the public scope. And there was a great deal of effort to try to convince the press to write, write about this speech. But because his civil rights speech was a day later, this didn't really get the attention that it deserved at the time. Great. Roll the tape. What kind of a peace do I mean, and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on Earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and build a better life for their children, not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women, not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. Our problems are man-made, Therefore, they can be solved by man, and man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. No government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. As Americans, we find communism profoundly repugnant as a negation of personal freedom and dignity. But we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space, in economic and industrial growth, in culture, in acts of courage. Finally, my fellow Americans, let us examine our attitude towards peace and freedom here at home. The quality and spirit of our own society must justify and support our efforts abroad. We must show it in the dedication of our own lives, as many of you who are graduating today will have an opportunity to do by serving without pay in the Peace Corps abroad or in the proposed National Service Corps here at home. But wherever we are, we must all in our daily lives live up to the age-old faith that peace and freedom walk together. In too many of our cities today, the peace is not secure because freedom is incomplete. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. So Nick, you uh, wrote recently, you thought it was one of the most important speeches in the last 50 years. Why is it such an important speech? I think it's the most important presidential speech of the last 50 years, and also Kennedy's most important speech for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a big speech. It breaks away from the conventional thinking of the Cold War. It sets a lot of very ambitious goals on the far horizon and asks people to think about them. So what did he say? 
He said we shouldn't demonize our adversary, the Soviet Union. We can compete, but if we demonize the Soviet Union, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's a message for how Americans might look at Iran today. It says that we must have a strategy for peace, and he says it would be a dangerous defeatist belief to believe that peace is not possible. Are we so cynical in 2013, 50 years later, to believe that peace is not possible? Kennedy challenged that part of the orthodoxy. And finally, at the end of the speech, he refers to the human interest, which is different than the national interest. And for me, and I assign this speech to my students at the Kennedy School, this is remarkably prescient. And if you read the speech and you take the date off, it, he's really speaking to the globalized world of 2013 because the human interest of climate change and trafficking of men and women and, 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 and of terrorism and WMD, these are global problems that all of us have and we have to fight together. And Kennedy was saying the human interest is not going to be served if we just consider the narrow national interest. So I think if you take these ideas, and the courage that he had to put them forward. This is 1963. He was going to be challenged in 1964 by someone like Barry Goldwater. And he had to be sure that, um, obviously, he was prepared to be reelected. He was sending a big message to the American military and to the national security establishment that we're heading down the wrong war and as road. And as Adam said, it has to be understood in the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And to go from 1961, which Fred has written about in this fantastic book, Berlin 1961, where Kennedy makes a series of misjudgments. And to arrive at the wisdom of June 1963, it's a remarkable journey, and I, I think unassailably the greatest presidential speech of the last half century. What did they think of it in the Soviet Union? What did your father think of the speech? You know, it was a different reaction than in the United States, where it was uh, really uh, seen not very important. It one of the few speeches of the foreign leaders that was fully published in the old Soviet newspapers, including Pravda and all others. It was only three of them. It was the uh, <coughs> press club speech of President Eisenhower in 1953, the Winston Churchill's speech in the House of Commons in the May 1953, and this speech, because my father thought it was the same reflection what he is thinking, because it was in the April 1953, and in March 1963, my father spoke for the um, Defense Council. It was such a body was combined politicians in the military, and he told that now we are confronted with the United States, and we are very different. Both of us, me and the President Kennedy, defended our treasures, defended our national interests. We have one in common. We want to preserve peace, and I think that we can preserve the peace. Working together, he believed that President Kennedy has another six years, and he and he told to the Soviet military, it was not public speech, it was just business speech, he told that we have to prepare to the big changes in our security policy because now we have the retaliation capability and when we will have from three to 400 warheads that can reach American territory, we stop building <coughs> missiles and we will reduce our conventional armed forces to less than a million from uh, 3.5 million at that time, about 5.5 million in the end of the Stalin era. And we will bring close to the zero of production of conventional weapons because in this era, if America will not attack us, we don't need these conventional weapons because we are wasting our resources through this. If we live in peace, it will be no attack then we have to invest in the, our economy and the life of our people because not that political and economical system will win in this competition that will be more powerful military, but that will preserve the better life to the people. And it was the big changes and it was strong position in the uh, Soviet military and maybe it was one of the causes why uh, 
then he would remove the power a little bit later. So they have many similarity in the both of these speeches. And Adam, you indicated this earlier, but it's a speech that seems to have ripened with age. Well, why do you think it had, has this kind of lasting quality to it that 50 years we would still be kind of inspired by the words? You know, I think it's a few things. The writing is, I mean, just hearing the president recite it, it is a beautifully yeah. written speech. Uh, and, and, and Ted's and JFK's writing is the standard for every speechwriter who comes after. Um, but Ted used to, one of the things Ted used to always talk about was that the quality of a speech was not just about the words. Um, it wasn't just about the nice turn of phrase. What made a speech great was the quality of the ideas. Um, and a mean speech, even if it's well written, a divisive speech, even if it's well written, will not stand the test of time. Um, and so I think there's uh, some truth in that. And that is part of what accounts for it. Um, thinking about uh, uh, what Nick was talking about, about the human interest in the speech. Um, and how just around the same time, President Kennedy was talking about um, how we all breathe the same air, and we all cherish our children's future. He was also calling civil rights a moral issue as old as the scriptures, appealing to a sort of a higher plane, both in domestic and foreign policy. Um, and I think that's why it's to the test of time, because all these years later, he removed it from Soviets versus Americans or uh, black versus white to a higher moral plane um, that we all see the truth about. It's uh, interesting. I mean, he foreshadows the civil rights speech uh, in this speech. I included that clip where he talks about we have to reevaluate our own attitudes, not only to the Soviet Union. And, you know, it's not often we hear our presidents tell us we have to reexamine our attitudes. Uh, but he says towards uh, peace and freedom at home because freedom is incomplete in many cities um, throughout the country. Um, I thought I might relate, uh, I think if Mr. Sorensen was here, he might relate the anecdote. Um, when you read this speech, uh, it's really infused, um, if, if, you, if it had a religious undertone, uh, you could argue it's a Unitarian um, philosophy that's being articulated there. And Ted Sorensen uh, would tell the story that one time President Kennedy uh, looked over at him and said, uh, so Ted, uh, is my Catholicism uh, begun to rub off on you yet? Uh, at which point Ted Sorensen responded and said, no, I'm sorry, Mr. President, it's my Unitarianism that's making its way into your speeches. Um, and this is certainly a prime example of that. Fred. The, 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 there's one other thing that I think is worth reflecting on, and, and that is both in the Soviet Union and in the United States, there's a domestic political struggle between so-called hardliners and right. so-called softliners. And after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, for Khrushchev, there could be nothing better than this speech because it shows that he actually has an opportunity to stay on the course he wants to stay on, but he is under onslaught and he is under pressure, not totally recognized in Washington, from people who think he's being too soft and has been too soft in the United States, which was partly what also uh, helped breed the, the Cuban Missile Crisis where you yourself were told by your father that he believed that Kennedy would huff and puff and huff and puff your words, if, if uh, Mr. Khrushchev, if, if, and if you didn't, um, uh, it, it, once the missiles were in, they wouldn't disappear. Kennedy also, particularly 1961, but also continuing through 63, there are hardliners and softliners in his administration. And, and, uh, and in fact, the hardliners, the, Paul Nitza, Dean Acheson earlier, but had left by this time, uh, the Berlin sort of desk people, what we called the Berlin Mafia, uh, would call the softliners on Berlin slobs, S-L-O-B, softliners on Berlin. And, 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 and Arthur Schlesinger and Ted Sorensen were considered leading slobs in, in, to, to these hardliners. And so this is really Kennedy landing on the side of the doves, on the side of the people who wanted peace, after really quite an internal struggle himself, uh, where uh, and you saw him going back and forth. In fact, we'll get to the Berlin speech, but there are still shades of that in, in, his, in, in his Ich bin ein Berliner speech. And so you're seeing a real interesting, uh, all uh, administrations have different feuding sides, but I think you see the ascendancy here of, uh, of the, the Ted Sorensen, Arthur Schlesinger, Avril Harriman side. Well, just, uh, just on, that, on that point, uh, Dean Acheson, as one of the harder yeah. liners early on in the administration, um, uh, took a more aggressive stance in terms of his advice during the missile crisis and afterwards was quoted in the press as saying that JFK got lucky during the missile crisis and Ted saw that 
and said, he's right. We were lucky we didn't listen to Dean Acheson. <laughs> <laughs> so Fred, uh, can you just set up, uh, so now uh, President Kennedy is thinking of going over uh, to Europe, and really there's no choice but to go to Berlin. Yeah. Uh, but again, in you know, retrospect, we kind of assume that the crowd was ready to welcome him with open arms, and it was this moment. But there was some question. I mean, there were some who critiqued his response. Um, to the building of the wall, including Willie Brandt and others. So set the stage, and, and why was it important for an American president to go to Europe uh, at that moment uh, in Europe's history? Uh, 1963 is a very, very complicated year. Uh, and three issues set up the Berlin trip. Uh, one of them is, and we haven't talked about it yet, but it was Im hugely important that year was the Elysee Treaty. Uh, of, of January of 1963 between uh, the French and the Germans. Uh, de Gaulle was really trying to form a French-led Europe that would be as independent as possible from both Russia and the United States. Adenauer was trying to have it both ways, uh, to be close to the French and be close to the United States. But inside, and Chancellor Adenauer, the, the West German Chancellor. Uh, uh, but within his government, you have Gaullists and Atlanticists. Some want to be closer to the French, some want to be closer to the Americans. And Chancellor Adenauer is somewhere in between. And Willy Brandt, the mayor of Berlin, after hugely criticizing uh, Kennedy over the uh, acquiescence to the building of the wall, has become very pro-Kennedy and has become the strongest Atlanticist. So that's point one, the whole Elysee, Gaullist part. And in some ways, he's trying to one-up de Gaulle. He is the first allied leader to visit Berlin in 18 years, the last one having been Harry Truman after the Potsdam Conference. Second issue is the whole uh, issue that he now wants to push detente. But to push detente, he has to get the West Europeans to think this is a good idea, and that he's not selling out their interests for a closer relationship with, uh, with the Russians, with the Soviets. And in fact, that's part of the reason why Adenauer likes de Gaulle so much, because de Gaulle is saying, we won't negotiate with the Soviets. We certainly won't negotiate over Berlin. Kennedy is growing much closer to the British leader, Harold Macmillan, and, uh, and, and to Willy Brandt on the issue that you have to engage. And Willy Brandt loves this engagement because it matches his own engagement with the Soviets at East, and in the East Germans particularly, which is being called Ostpolitik. And then there's the whole drama of returning or going to the city for the first time, uh, the, the place of the wall. He's nervous enough about this trip that he sends his brother, uh, Robert Kennedy, Attorney General, there ahead to test the waters. Uh, and the Attorney General returns and says, you know, this is going to turn out pretty well for you. And Lucius Clay, General Clay, also was there ahead of time and also thought it would turn out just fine. Um, but, uh, but really, the real drama begins when he sets ground in Berlin, sets, sets foot in Berlin, and takes a 33-mile trip by open car with uh, Mayor Brandt, with uh, Chancellor uh, Adenauer, standing in the back of this car, one million people lining the road, 60% uh, of the West Berlin population to greet him, and he is mesmerized by this uh, 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 far beyond uh, his, uh, his wildest dreams, of, uh, far beyond anything he had experienced in his presidency, he says himself. In fact, some of his aides were so concerned during this, they at first said, oh no, is this the same German crowds, the same kind of German crowds that greeted Hitler? And then the further and further they went, the more they were infected by the fact that this had nothing to do with fascism, this had to do with freedom, and had to do with democracy. And they were welcoming the person who could defend it, and, and who they hoped would, would defend them. And so that's really the, uh, uh, the context for this trip. Great. Uh, so he had given the task to the speechwriters to write a speech that would both show his solidarity with the people of West Berlin, but not offend uh, the Soviets. Uh, and he read the draft on the way over, uh, and he realized you couldn't do both. Uh, and in many ways, uh, as Fred just said, he was so affected by the moment and so affected by the crowds uh, that this is one case where he almost rejected the entire uh, reading copy that he was given uh, and uh, formulated uh, the speech in his own mind and uh, gave it extemporaneously. The, for the, for the whole first third of the speech is extemporaneous eloquence. Exactly. 
he went into Willy Brandt's office, uh, and there were two German translators there, and he asked the famous question, how would I say I am a citizen of Berlin? We'll talk about that and uh, whether he got it right or not in a moment. Uh, and actually, on the back of your program, we just did a photocopy of that famous index card uh, in which uh, he writes down the Latin phrase that he wants to use and then the two German phrases. So again, there are no teleprompters at this speech, so when you watch the clip, uh, you know, he is not looking down. The only time he looks down at his uh, text is to look at that index card again, and he wrote out phonetically uh, the way to say these Latin phrases uh, and the German phrases. Uh, so again, and, and imagine Ted Sorensen and McGeorge Bundy's horror as they saw him going far beyond where they thought policy was at the moment. <laughs> uh, we're going to show, uh, you'll, it's just, we're just going to hear the speech, but the initial clips are also uh, of those moments before he gives the speech of him looking uh, at the wall, and you'll see some clips of how the barrenness of, uh, oh good, and here we are joined by... Welcome. Wonderful to see you. So we're just going to watch the Berlin speech. Um, so the initial clips are the moments before he gives the speech where he looks at the wall uh, and he looks at the barrenness of East Berlin. And then you'll hear uh, not the whole speech, but excerpts of it. So we can roll a clip. Two thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, the proudest post war, Kiwis, Romanus, Sum. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest post is Ishti Angelina. There are many people in the world who really don't understand, or say they don't. What is the great issue between the free world and the communist world? Let them come to Berlin. There are some who say, there are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Let them come to Berlin. And there are even a few who say that it's true that communism is an evil system, but it permits us to make economic progress. Lots the not Berlin in common. Let them Freedom is indivisible. And when one man is enslaved, all are not free. When all then we look and look forward to that day when this city will be joined as one and this country and this great continent of Europe in a peaceful and hopeful globe. When that day finally comes, as it will, the people of West Berlin can take sober satisfaction in the fact that they were in the front lines citizens of Berlin, and therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. So Marvin Kell, what, what did that speech mean in the history of the Cold War as you covered it? First of all, my deepest apologies to everyone for coming so late, but a wave of nostalgia rolled over me. I covered that speech, and I covered the one at American University. And first of all, there's the beauty of the language. Then there is the huge diplomatic point that is being made by Kennedy there, turning in effect to the Russians, to the communists, and saying, this will not be forever. This is a moment that will pass. And if you have any doubt, come to Berlin and see the guts that is on display at every moment. 
and with the American University speech at that point, and I assume you've been dealing yes. with this, <laughs> at, at that speech, which I remember so vividly, Kennedy seemed to be totally into it. First of all, it was a great speech. It was a magnificently written speech. And it was delivered between two large historical events, in my judgment. One was the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, when Kennedy looked into the chasm of a possible nuclear war. And the next was Kennedy's participation in the killing of President Diem in Vietnam, mm -hmm. which was one of the huge blunders of his administration in the area of foreign policy. And yet, in the middle of it, what he was saying to himself, because Vietnam hadn't yet happened, was that we were so close to a horror that cannot be allowed to happen again, and that we must look towards something that is different, that is new. In those days, people in the United States were building <clears throat> air raid shelters against nuclear weapons, as though that could ever work. And what Kennedy was saying was there's another way. We've got to find a diplomatic way of resolving this question of atmospheric nuclear testing. And what Kennedy did with that speech was open the prospect of legitimate negotiation, which did start to the conclusion of a treaty within several months, that this would be the beginning of a series of arms control agreements that we are still living with right now. And I think that what Kennedy did at that point was put an exclamation point on the possibility that this could happen. And it was his vision articulated in that speech that I think opened the door. And it was an extraordinary moment. I got to tell one other story, if you don't mind. Please. The Berlin speech, that was an example of what we used to call Kennedy weather. Believe it or not, the sun was shining during the speech. But 20 minutes before the speech, it was pouring. <laughs> and I remember the networks were all trying to protect their cameras. And uh, we didn't really care that much about the speech. We were trying to protect our cameras. <laughs> <laughs> and other people would say, but it's Kennedy. It's Kennedy. It's not going to happen. The rains will stop. <laughs> <It's> ridiculous. <laughs> but they did. This plane came in. The sun shone, and that speech was delivered. It was quite a fantastic moment. <laughs> well, as always, it's well worth the wait, so thank you for thank you. Uh, joining our panel. Um, Nick, it's a very different tone than the American University speech. One of the lines we don't, didn't include is, freedom has many difficulties and democracy is not perfect but we never had to build a wall to keep our people in. I mean, he's really going at the Soviets um, at that moment. Talk about that duality of uh, the olive branch and the American University speech, and this is kind of a gotcha speech. I think it represents um, a truth about international politics, especially when it's being practiced by a great power, and between great powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, that you need to f wait, find a way to combine diplomacy, and we saw that in the American University speech with that arching rhetoric, soaring rhetoric, and, and with the, the deep convictions that there's a way forward, not through war, but through negotiations, the limited test ban treaty. But you also have to show toughness and resolve. And on issues of human freedom and in Germany, that was the issue, freedom for the, uh, the German people. Uh, you, you, you've got to be um, strong. And so the best presidents are the presidents who can combine both a sense of the threat of force or the solidity of our military power with diplomacy. And when you're a diplomat, and I was a working diplomat for a long time, it's always good to have that duality present. You're not going to get very far if all you've got is an olive branch. You've also got to have strength on your side. And Kennedy certainly had strength because we were by far, in many ways, the strongest power in the world. He had to convey that. And again, um, the politics is important, too. Kennedy was a Cold Warrior. He was going to be opposed in 1964. He had to maintain that base at home, important part of his domestic policy as well as his foreign policy. So uh, you told me earlier what you thought of the speech, but tell me again, the Soviet, how, do, how was this speech received in the Soviet Union and by your father? It was very different from the uh, American University speech because in Soviet Union, it was seen more like a propagandist speech 
because you came to the West Berlin and you are the representative of the superpower and you are, have the burden of superpower to protect this country. It was very well designed propagandist yeah. speech, but American University speech, it was really strategic speech that show that we can negotiate, we can talk, and we can change the world together. By the way, Khrushchev visited the Berlin Wall half a year before the Kennedy, but without speeches. But he had the same big crowds in the, same, in the East Germany with the same cheering. It just reminded me of what I saw there. So it was part of the German nature. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> There was a little bit more uh, choreography on the East German side, and, and a little bit less spontaneity. But but the uh, if you if you look at the if if if, if 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 you look at the film that you just saw, and you saw those posters going up and the flags going up the Brandenburg Gate, they were put up by East German authorities, so the crowds on East Berlin could not see Kennedy, and Kennedy couldn't see them. So so let's be the the. the but I'll tell you what. To, to me, what was really interesting about this, and I agree with Nick on this, is, is and, and here, you know, you, you, the, the analog is, is President Reagan and the evil empire, but then all these negotiations with Gorbachev. Uh, it is true that Khrushchev didn't like this speech at all. He, be, he belittled it at the time as de Gaulle and I Kennedy. Didn't, I didn't say that he didn't like this speech at all. I told that he didn't pay too much attention to this. <laughs> don't, uh, well, don't transform my words. He, he, <laughs> <laughs> he, I would never do such a thing, <laughs> despite the fact that I'm a lifelong journalist. Um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Khrushchev at the time said this was de Gaulle and Kennedy uh, competing over the old widow of West Germany. So he was trying to uh, b belittle it in, in that respect. But what, uh, w there, was some, there is some truth to the fact that they, he was one-upping De Gaulle. The, but the, the other thing that happened was after the speech, he goes to the fr Free University, and then he gives the detente speech, and he gives the peaceful coexistence speech. And he further develops the idea of American University. So he sends one he sends the politician's message to the West Berlin crowd, giving them what they need to hear and want to hear. It was politically significant because it took America and Kennedy from being an American bystander in the front line of the Cold War in Berlin to being a Berliner. Ich bin ein Berliner. So he's saying, I'm one of you and I'm with you on the front line. And that put the prestige, uh, uh, and it in intertwined America with the future and the, and the, and the uh, 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 of Berlin more solidly than ever before, and there was no walking that back after that. On the other hand, after the speech, he then sent a message that was intended to be the message to the Soviets, which is this doesn't really change what I said at American University. Right. And uh, do you want to clarify uh, the linguistic question of the whether you should have said Ein Berlin or you'd do that in your book rather well? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that very quickly. The, there is a myth that he really got the grammar wrong, and, and, and a, Ber, a, a Berliner in Germany is a pastry. And so, uh, and so that he said to this great crowd of 300,000 plus, I am a jelly donut. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and the fact is, and I did some research into this, he, he actually took advice from uh, Chancellor Adenauer's uh, interpreter and from Christian Lochner, who was the head of the radio uh, uh, in the American sector of Berlin. And they both told him not to put, not to take the ein out. Then he would say, ich bin Berliner, grammatically correct, but it could have caused confusion in the crowd that he was actually born in Berlin. So they actually uh, advised him to put the ein in there, which means I am a Berliner rather than I'm Berliner. And that would make more clear and actually drive the point home more solidly, which is what every speechwriter would want. So he actually did the right thing, and he didn't tell the crowd that he was a jelly donut. Although <laughs> the myth was obviously so, well, uh, uh, you know, believed uh, that when Ted Sorensen went uh, a few years later uh, to speak to students at Hamburg, he said his only regret was that President Kennedy had not been able to come to the city of Hamburg to say, Ich bin ein Hamburger. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Adam, are there other stories from uh, the, Mr. Sorensen's book about that day in Berlin, that trip, and well, what it meant? Just to what Fred was talking about, I mean, I mean, it was a powerful day, I think, for everyone who was there. They, they saw crowds that the President had not seen before, that Ted, who had traveled and been with the President at that point since 1953, had not seen ever with him. Um, and I know that at the end of the long trip, um, when they got back on uh, Air Force One, the President uh, sat back down in his chair and turned to Ted and said, we're never going to have another day like that one. Um, and, and, and as Ted noted in uh, Counselor, that was true, sadly. Um, but it, it was a day that spoke to, I think, uh, you know, President Kennedy and just sort of seeing the hunger uh, among the German people for freedom and what, that, what his presence meant. Uh, but more broadly, uh, what President Kennedy meant to the world um, and at sort of a high watermark that, that hasn't much diminished uh, over time. But there's, my sense is that there's a difference here, though, that I think is important to point out. If Ted Sorensen and the President enjoyed the day, that is understandable within the context of the East-West struggle. And a big propaganda point had been made that day. But it had been made so eloquently, so marvelously, that everybody felt elevated by the experience, all but Khrushchev, who had always regarded Berlin as the bone in my throat. And this was an issue that was central to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So Berlin uh, struck not only a diplomatic note, but a deeply emotional note on both sides, but within the East-West context. That's why I feel that the American University speech looked well beyond propaganda. It dealt with fundamentally uh, important reasons separating the two sides. How do you deal with nuclear weapons? We're still struggling with that same issue now. I mean, there are great statesmen in the United States and around the world who would like to eliminate all weapons and go down to zero. Well, in those days, we couldn't even imagine that because Mothers were concerned that the milk that their children was drinking was spoiled by the testing in the atmosphere. And Kennedy was working not only in that political environment, but in a real um, emotional effort on his part, on Sorensen's part to find the language, but on any American who had half a brain. You had to find a way out of the Cold War. You couldn't just allow it to continue. And American University was a big step in the direction of moving both sides toward a more sensible relationship with each other. And do you want to uh, tell us the follow-up story, which I'm sure you covered, about how did the limited nuclear test ban treaty actually get negotiated? Were, were you hopeful? Did people think that that was something that? Oh, I think after the American University speech, all of the cynics, of which I was one, um, felt that something is now going to happen, yes. And the reason had less to do with the American University speech than it did with the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because that was where everything was coming together. That was where the possibility of a war between the two superpowers was actually not contemplated but considered in both capitals. So it was terribly important for them to get out of that rut. And the American University speech sort of set us in the right direction. And that's why I think that that speech, not only brilliantly written and delivered, was crucially important for breaking the logjam, for pointing the way towards some sensible resolution of the, of the atomic, the nuclear crisis, which I think is still with us. Nick, it's really remarkable when you think, so in the fall of 1961, you have these tanks face off in Berlin. In the fall of 62, same thing now in Cuba. And then the fall of 63, they're coming together to sign a treaty that unique in the history of diplomacy, you know, that such two arch um, superpowers that almost at war with each other could then come to sign such a treaty. I don't know if it's unique in the history of diplomacy, but it, what we saw was wisdom. And I, I share Marvin's assessment of the speech. And the greatness of the speech 
is in the poetry. It's in the ideas. It's in the political courage to say what he said. Yes, he and it's in the wisdom. And what I find most meaningful about President Kennedy's time in office is that he grew so much in office. And he really learned from his mistakes. We don't always see that from our presidents. It's hard to even judge 50 years later as the Kennedy presidency. You judge our greatest presidents, Lincoln, the wisdom of Lincoln in trying to heal the country after the Civil War, the wisdom of FDR in creating the United Nations, in being with his wife, the person who pushed that. We rarely find it. And when the chips are down, and in this case, the world was facing nuclear conflagration, to have a president and a Soviet premier who both found their way to the wisdom of pulling back, of assessing the human interest taking precedence over the national interest. We were so fortunate to have those two people, Khrushchev and Kennedy, together in 1963. Remarkable. It wasn't coincidental, because these two men were able to draw upon the, the best within them to make these decisions. And that's why both of these speeches are so important. And I agree with Marvin. I think the American University speech really alone over the last 50 years. It stands alone. There's no president who's given anything even close to it in terms of the wisdom and meaning mm -hmm. of that speech. So we'll be turning to your written questions in a moment. So if you have them, you can give them to the staff who will bring them up. But uh, I guess the other thing that makes the speeches and the signing of that treaty uh, and the speech in Berlin somewhat more remarkable is the fact that President Kennedy died so soon after. And um, what was your father's lasting impressions of John F. Kennedy as a man, especially um, after he passed away? I would repeat what he said, that he told that he is defending interests of his own country, but his vision is broader, that both of them want to preserve the peace. They're talking about the humanity. And through this, after that, when the, he heard that the <coughs> Kennedy was senated, he thought that Soviet Union have also to pay tribute to the American president, and it was the president of the enemy's country. It was your president, it was not Soviet president. And he told, we have to send very high level delegation there, even I would like to go there, but then he told, maybe it will not be very welcomed by Americans in such place, so he sent his most famous diplomat, Mikhail today, and it was also different in all the Soviet and the Russian history when he told that my mother have to send the colonists to the Jackie, that they never did this. From this person, his show through this, his personal feeling to the greatness of this young president. Uh, there's too much to cover, but <clears throat> Berlin after that time, uh, uh, first, in some ways, Kennedy's visit diffused the crisis. It really was never as tense after that. There was no question, really, that the US would always defend Berlin after Kennedy had given that speech. But the Soviets somewhat, or the East Germans somewhat back. But you, you tell the story about you know, what happened to Berlin after 1963. Um, the, the legacy of Kennedy in Berlin and in West Germany, Federal Republic of Germany, went from being the person who acquiesced to the construction of the Berlin Wall to the person who defended freedom in Germany and laid the groundwork for potential unification. That's a pretty dramatic shift. But what the wall did is it froze a situation uh, for 28 years. And so who knows what would have happened if the wall hadn't been constructed at that time? Would you have had an earlier collapse of uh, the Warsaw Pact? Would you have had war? Uh, you know, uh, uh, in the forward to my book, uh, Brent Scowcroft writes that history doesn't reveal its alternatives, and so it doesn't. Uh, but what we do know is that the wall uh, became, uh, that, that we froze ourselves into place for 28 years, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and then we just really began a standoff where uh, the, the relative quality of the two systems could compete with each other over time. Uh, so I don't think that President Kennedy could have known in those days that the Cold War would end as it did, but he did have the same sort of faith in the, in the uh, ultimate strength of, 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 of the American system, the Western system. Uh, 
Uh, so before I go to the question from the audience, I did want to, uh, President Obama gave a major speech um, last week, and I thought uh, I'd ask the panelists, maybe starting with you, Adam, since you recently were writing speeches for him. I mean, it, was that the equivalent of John F. Kennedy's American University speech, or how, how would you compare what President Obama did last week? Well, to I think you always have to look at speeches on their own uh, and in their own context. Um, but one thing that did strike me as I was um, listening to the President's speech uh, and um, thinking about President Kennedy's speech um, is that the American University speech is built around uh, speechwriters call it a riff, uh, you have, uh, sort of a theme um, that you can re keep returning to. Um, and so in that speech, it was about re-examining, it was the theme of re-examination, re-examining uh, our attitude toward peace, re-examining our approach toward the Soviets, re-examining the Cold War. Um, and so it seems to me that there is a, a similarity at that level um, with the President's speech the other week, um, where he um, called on us to re-examine our uh, approach to the global war on terror uh, uh, and sort of taking a step back and thinking about it um, uh, and, and sort of calling into question some of our assumptions and the way we've been doing things. So at that level, I think there, was, there were some similarities. Nick, any comments about the speech you heard last week? I thought it was a remarkable speech. Um, I even want to return to it this week to read it again because it's, it's almost as if President Obama wanted to have a conversation with the American people. And he posed probably more questions in the speech than he gave answers for. Uh, but it was a big speech because it dealt with war and peace. Are we going to continue this war forever against terrorism, against Islamic terrorism? Are we going to bring it to a close and look at it in a different way and prosecute the war in a different way? That's a very important question in the 12 years after 9-11. Um, and he has used speeches, Adam, I think, very effectively throughout his presidency to raise big issues with the American people. So uh, I, I like the speech, uh, but I think there's probably another speech that he has to give as an addendum to it because it was a speech that maybe raised more questions than gave us vision. Marvin Kelly. Well, just picking up that point, I read it twice. I felt it was a major speech, but at the same time, I was terribly disappointed in it. I thought the president time and time again walked up to a decision and then didn't take it. Um, on Guantanamo, he raises the issue but then backs off. Um, on the war on terrorism, what is it that you do? Take a look at the 2001 authorization to use military force, which in effect was an act of Congress, obviously signed by the president, in which the president has the authority to conduct war effectively anywhere in the world. So he says, you know, this is something that we ought to give up on. But then again, he takes no action on it. On, on every single major issue, he walked up and did nothing. For example, on an issue having to do with the media, which I'm concerned about a great deal, he said that he was anguished by the chill that investigative reporters probably feel now because of the deep probes by the FBI and the Department of Justice into the legitimate activity of journalists trying to find out information. But what did he do about it? He's president. He could have stopped that, but he didn't. He simply raises the question. And it raises a question in my mind whether he enjoys raising questions to strike a certain note that may indeed even be consistent with his innermost feelings. But he's president, he has the authority to act, and on a number of issues he takes you up to the well, but he doesn't provide the water. And on journalism, you cannot take the action that he is doing now. In allowing this to happen to a reporter for Fox News, to the Associated Press, and use as a reason national security. I went through this with Nixon. <laughs> Nixon did everything to me that you can do to a journalist, all because of national security. And when it was all over, nothing, nothing had been threatened. Nothing. All he had to do was to turn on the set onto CBS and watch what I said. There was nothing secret. Now, when Obama, who was not at all like Nixon, begins to act like Nixon, that raises a huge problem in my mind. 
So I'm going to turn now to um, questions from the audience. We have time for a few. And uh, Dr. Khrushchev, the first one is to you, which is uh, how do people think about your father now in Russia or how is he taught in the history books, uh, his role in uh, Soviet and Russian history? Russia is very different now. Russia now is living through the rebirth of the Stalinism and rewriting the Russian history second time. So when we look in the history book that they're reading now and teaching in the schools, if you watch Russian TV, you will see there they told very successful manager, Mr. Stalin, he is now not a comrade, very successful manager, his right hand and secret police chief, Mr. Beria, and they, they're praising the police state that running through the police. And it is very effective because it is no such discussion between different channels, Fox News and CNN. It was the same, because they have a position, but this position also was picked by Kremlin. So they're accusing now the foreign countries of the falsification, the history. And I remember, it was at school, it was the big article everywhere when accusing the foreign countries falsification of the history, and it was the Stalin's article. So it is the same there, and through this, Stalin now became the symbol of the new Russia. It was the voting there on the TV that they copied some British program where you can vote who is the symbol of the Russia. And the majority voted in the Stalin. They were so shocked that they canceled this and after they manipulated and they bringing the one of the ancient Russian princes that he is the symbol of the Russia and not the Stalin. Stalin was put in the third place. So this is... And how about your father? No, I am answering. You cannot say that Stalin was good and Khrushchev was good. So Khrushchev now blame on everything, on all failures, that really it was Khrushchev who ran the secret police with all these uh, purges and the... Uh, uh, executions, that he was the most brutal person in the, all the Russian history, and so on. And you can say nothing there, because everything there just managing from one place, and we know this place, it is placed in the one of the department of the FSB, the former KGB, who is writing this story. And you know how you can write the counter propaganda. So Khrushchev, is not really known, but if he is known, he is a very bad person. Mm -hmm. And really, in this country, Marvin, now, um, he's viewed and almost that JFK was fortunate that Khrushchev, I mean, in some instances, that, that that's who the person that JFK was negotiating with, for instance, for the arms. Um, yeah, I've, I've always felt that Khrushchev was one of the most uh, human of the dictators I've covered. Um, <laughs> No, in the following way, I had occasion in 1956 when I was working at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, I was one of four people at the embassy who spoke Russian. And so Ambassador Bolin was always assigning me to deal with a, a Russian when they all arrived at the embassy for these big national events. And Khrushchev was someone I was assigned to, and he had a wonderful sense of humor. And he looked up at me one time and he said, um, how tall are you? I said, I'm six centimeters shorter than Peter the Great. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, that was a good answer. That was a good answer. And from then on, whenever he saw me among the journalists, he would say, what did you Piotr Veliki? There goes Peter the Great. And <laughs> But he was the kind of guy who would also give you a new story. He was a very original Soviet leader. He actually manipulated the press. He played with us. He gave us little bits and pieces. 
and we knew it, and he knew it. It was terrific. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, on a Wednesday evening, Jerome Hines, the American opera star, was singing at the Bolshoi. I was there because my wife insisted that we go. <laughs> but she was right. <laughs> she was absolutely right because um, in intermission, Khrushchev arrived in the main balcony with the entire Politburo. And when the opera was over, he went back to pay his respects to an American opera star. The secret, his Secret Service people allowed me to follow him. And when we were all there together, Khrushchev turned to me and said, I am here to honor an American singer. That means we will be able to work this out. We will be able to do this. And then he looked at me, those sort of eye to eye, and said, you do understand what I'm saying. He wasn't sure, neither was I, that my Russian was that good. <laughs> but he said, you do understand it. We will work this out. Well, what Soviet leader would do that except Khrushchev? He was, he was very human and, I think, extraordinarily clever. Uh, the last question from the audience, uh, and it's to you, Adam, since this is a forum about speech writing, and you have glimpses of how it was done during President uh, Kennedy's administration and now how it's done uh, today. What are the differences in presidential speech writing today? Has, a, has the presidency lost its bully pulpit, or how would you? Well, well it is a, it's a very different climate and a very different environment to be writing speeches in. Uh, when uh, President Kennedy was president, the speechwriting staff was very, very, was, was essentially one. Um, Ted, he had help from Mike Feldman and Dick Goodwin and, uh, uh, and Arthur Schlesinger and a couple others, but um, the president gave, uh, didn't give nearly as many per, the, of the kinds of remarks that the president is expected to give today. Often he'd go out and talk to reporters without a prepared script. He'd just go and, uh, and do his thing. Uh, today there's a staff of eight people, uh, and that's been the case um, more or less constant through the past several administrations. Um, and the, the level of uh, scrutiny, the schedule, uh, the president will go out on a daily basis, um, uh, is, just, is, is much more intense. I do think also that one of the other more notable differences um, is when uh, President Kennedy was delivering speeches, they were covered by folks like Marvin, who, who, and people listened to those uh, reporters uh, and could um, uh, hear in sort of a direct way what the president was saying. Uh, now, whenever the president gives remarks, um, they're refracted through so many different um, voices on the, on online, on uh, cable, et cetera, that it's very difficult for people to actually hear just what the president is saying. Um, spe full texts of speeches used to be printed in the papers, and people would actually read them. Um, now, I doubt they're printed in most papers, and I doubt folks uh, uh, read them. So. Uh, it's a very different kind of uh, environment, but I will say that we do have a president who uh, cares about the written word, um, uh, certainly as much as uh, I, I, from all that Ted said, JFK did. Um, so some things don't change. Great. <laughs> so we've asked to, to um, have some closing remarks uh, from Professor Axel Klossmeyer, who can come to the podium, who's the president of the Berlin Wall Foundation and Museum. Uh, and as he's coming to the podium, let me invite all of you. He's giving a lecture Thursday evening at the Goethe Institute here in Boston on the question of how Germany in general and Berlin in particular copes with both the legacy of the Nazi dictatorship and the Holocaust, as well as that of the history of East Germany, the Berlin Wall, and the Cold War. So a few words from Dr. Klussmeyer. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you for giving me the chance to say a few words. Um, we have heard a lot tonight, and I, um, well, it's almost everything has been said. The only difference and the only addition I would la like to make is that the visit to Berlin was uh, part of a three-day visit to Germany, and it was the day before that he took a very big parade, a military parade in Hanau. And uh, also Fred Kemp has already said what it meant, what is the legacy of this. 
visit. And I think uh, it's mainly that it uh, showed strength. And I'm sort of looking at Hanau, at this ex immense military period. It, it's showing strength, it sh but it's also showing continuity and support for both, especially, I mean, for Berliners and for Germany. And uh, third, it is hope. And hope is for all of the Berliners, both in East and West. And this was, it meant continuity and it did uh, meant stability. Stability in terms of that the superpowers, since there was certainty over Berlin, that they could have a, sort of their focus and look to other even more dangerous regions such as Asia, Asia and the Far East. For what Kennedy said when he was, said, uh, was saying that Kivis Romanus Sum, it was in a way something that the demonstrators uh, in East Germany were saying and were translating into something like, wir sind das Volk, we are the people. So this is the, one of the slogans in 1989 that were used throughout East Germany. So it was also given hope, it was a, like a vision uh, uh, President Kennedy was giving. Well, the legacy in, from my point of view is also that, uh, well, first of all, there was ability. No other American president has been welcomed like this after him. And uh, so uh, this was something really special. And this is one of the, uh, in terms of freedom and democracy, uh, this was something he made very clear are not self-evident, especially not in a, in a, a world uh, like it was in 1963 and that has so well been described uh, tonight. Um, I believe that um, these, um, President Kennedy's view of the Germans changed during this very day, during these nine hours. He had been to Germany twice before. He had an, a vision of what Germans are like, and all of a sudden there were these crowds, and he was taken away uh, his, uh, by emotions um, during this um, uh, visit, and he saw that all of a sudden there are Democrats right in front of him. That was something very, very important uh, for him, and that uh, one should also at least mention the second great speech he gave at the Freie Universität, at the Free Uni University, two hours, just two hours later uh, after the uh, uh, town hall in Schöneberg, and that was more or less th something uh, that was more a policy of detente again. So this one that we have seen in Schöneberg was relatively aggressive, but sort of justifiable because of, of his emotions. Two hours later, and this is a, a, a small story I would like to end with, you have seen uh, Mayor Brandt listening, and he was standing there like, this, very stiff, very concerned, and Adenauer was smiling at this speech because this was the language of the Cold War. Two hours later at the Freie Universität, it was just the other way around because there Kennedy was giving this speech and he was developing this uh, theme he was, uh, had in, uh, 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 placed out in, in, in Washington three weeks earlier. And then Willy Brandt was laughing and smiling whereas Adenauer was stiff and didn't say a word. So um, in that respect, I think what we uh, uh, learn here, and this is what we remember in Berlin, is that um, he made very clear that, that uh, freedom and democracy cannot be uh, taken for granted, and this is something we cherish today. Thank you very much. So I promoted your book already once, but oh, I will so promote it again. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Kalb, uh, the book is on sale in our bookstore. Uh, he'll be signing copies uh, this evening and speaking on it tomorrow night at Porter Square uh, Books. And I thought I would end, uh, again, Dr. Klausmeier is an expert in the culture of memory. And this institution is the nation's memorial uh, to President John F. Kennedy. And I thought I might, in keeping with that, uh, give two quotes, both uh, from Ted Sorensen. Uh, really, the first is, the last lines of the inaugural address. Uh, I know that uh, Sergei Khrushchev and his wife are going back to Russia in two days to see their two sons and grandchildren. 
and Dr. Klossmeyer will be returning to Berlin, and uh, Mr. Kemp will actually be speaking in Berlin uh, next month, and uh, the rest of us here in the United States. I thought I would slightly alter the last line to the inaugural address, saying, let us go forth to lead the lands we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. And in his uh, memoir, uh, Mr. Sorensen uh, wrote uh, about the elegy uh, that W.H. Auden uh, wrote uh, after President Kennedy's death, and I thought those could be fittingly our closing words. Uh, referring to President Kennedy, Auden wrote, what he was, he was, what he is slated to become depends on all of us. I thank my fellow panelists this evening, and thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.